production where we explain a little more about okay. you and who you are. Cool. So we'll just fake this one. Yeah. Hey guys, welcome to the Disruptors, the show where we figured we got a future. We probably should make it better and disrupt shit that's happening now. The reason we re-record all of these intros is because it's terribly hard to do this. So we might as well just jump into it. Gabriel Lissinas on the program. He's a biohacker and all sorts of this is just a terrible introduction, so we're going to cut this all out anyways. Welcome to the program, Gabriel. Hey, thanks. Glad to be here. So there's a lot I want to talk to you about, but the first thing is I saw the picture of your eyes. You put chemicals in your eyes to see at night. What's what's the story behind this? Yeah, it's, it's the story that never dies. Um, so this was about four years ago now, and... Um, I had uh, finished up my degree at the University of Washington and was a little disenchanted with the way that university research progressed. Um, I wanted to see the full story arc. You know, you, you end up working on something cool in research, and I would talk about these projects with my friends, and they would be like, wow, this is amazing. I can't wait for this to get to market or have be the next step. And then what usually happens is research gets, uh, they smack a patent on it and then they just throw it in a bin somewhere and then nobody ever touches it again. So um, so I wanted to do more research myself. Uh, and I talked with my PI, who's like the principal investigator, he's like the boss of the lab. And I told him I wanted to, you know, my eventual goal was to have my own lab so I could do my own research. And he said, okay, well, great. Uh, first you, uh, go to grad school, you get your PhD, then you become a professor, then you get tenure, and then they give you a lab. And this is totally a con because 53% uh, of biology students are following the tenure track and about three to 4% of them actually get tenure. So that's a losing battle for almost everybody except for people to get free grad student labor. And so, um, it's a long one too. It's a long one. Oh my run. gosh. It's decades, decades of work for a payoff that may never happen and so much debt. So um, I finished my degree and uh, I left university and went down to California and lived with a friend for a while and started building a laboratory in a garage and uh, went from basically a, a bare stripped garage to a uh, fully functioning experimental laboratory. Um, we also had a clean room and a surgery suite. And um, and we ended up, uh, somebody turned us on to this project about um, uh, chlorine E6. It's, it's, a, it's a chemical found in the eyes of deep sea fish. It's a, it's a chlorophyll, so it's like found in plants and the deep sea fish eat the plants and then it gets into their eyes, allows them to see in low light conditions. And uh, we found a patent that nobody really cared about. Um, and the guy who made the patent was, you know, he had like a bazillion criminal charges on him. And so we were like, nobody's going to mind if we just take some of this patent and some of this research paper here and mash them up together. And we made these eye drops uh, that were a mixture of chlorine E6 and insulin and some other things. And we, we applied the, the, the chemical to my eyes and then, uh, and then tested it out. It was uh, promising. It was it was pretty cool. It was definitely exciting. A picture got posted on the internet, and that's how all this got started. We were not ready to start talking about the project in a broader scope like that. Um, but that didn't stop everyone else from being super super excited about it. Um, and really, we we've never been able to take the next step, which is to get some hard hard uh, data using uh, some very specific pieces of hardware that were just too expensive for us at the time. Um, yeah, but that's how that all happened. Why didn't you go further with it? I, I was, while I was researching this, I got my eyes dilated yesterday for mm -hmm. my eye exam. So your pictures were just nuts with the size of the pupils. What it, what, oh, no, what was so it those like? Were, those weren't the size of my pupils. This is a common misunderstanding. That was actually uh, some protective lenses. Imagine, like sunglasses, but on my eyeballs, uh, because we weren't it because it, it doesn't dilate the eyes. It actually the molecule goes in and it binds with the opsin protein and changes the excitation level of the photon as it enter, enters the eye. 
So it's it's actually way more technically sweet than just making your eyes dilate real hard. But we didn't we were being safe. And so we had protective lenses and we had sunglasses and we kept the lights low and all this other stuff because Were you terrified? No, I'm a professional. I did my research for half a year before I tested it. The the science was sound. Um, I'm not going to get, I mean, are you terrified when you go and get a, a shot? It's, it was sound science and I did the research. Still though, like when I think about hopping in an autonomous vehicle for the first time and closing my eyes, there's still that one moment, even thinking about doing like, I would like love to do LASIK surgery now mm -hmm. so that I don't have to wear contacts. Even the fact that there's that point oh oh one percent or whatever chance well, it is part of part of this has to do with like the concept of autonomy um so like when when you hop into a self-driving car you're used to driving a car um and so the concept that that has been taken away from you um is very is very weird it's you, it just hasn't been normalized yet you're totally comfortable getting in an uber um, even though I've been in some cars with people who drive them and people are not safe drivers. Yeah. They're texting while they're doing it. Like, what yeah, are you no, doing? You're, so you're totally comfortable getting in a car that's being driven by another human being, which we know statistically is unsafe. Um, but you're not comfortable getting in a self driving car because it's not normalized for you yet. You're totally comfortable, um, sticking a contact in your eye, like poking your finger in your eye but not comfortable getting LASIK just because again, that the autonomy is you'd rather poke yourself in the eye than have a medical procedure done to you. Um, so uh, it, this is the same thing. Uh, again, like I said, I, I do have a degree. I, I am a biologist. I did my research. I felt comfortable with it and it was very normal to me. I can understand how it would be a little weird for someone else, but you know, it's like putting in eye drops. When the first time you do it, you're all like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And then after a while, you just get used to it. And you're like, I'm putting a eye drops, moving on. Part of the reason I bring some of this up is you're an expert or you're very far along the path to expertdom in what I would call the biohacker movement, looking at how specific inputs affect human outputs and performance. A lot of people... You, you kind of see online and they're have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. What, what excites you about the biohacker movement today in terms of what's at the cutting? Edge? <clears throat> so, um, I think for me personally, cause I've kind of gone through like a, a, a personal shift. And so the things that excited me back when I was doing the eyedrop project are not the things that excite me now. Um, uh, I'm actually really ex excited about the, the gene level work that's being done and, and also environmental work. Like it's called biohacking, right? It's not called human hacking. Um, so for instance, genetically modifying trees to suck in more carbon, that's a sweet biohack. Or um, like creating a, a, a virus vaccine or a genetic modification that gets rid of uh, somebody's lactose intolerance. Like those are, I mean, that's, it's interesting that like biology is such a new fresh tool for us um, that, you know, we're still kind of just playing around with popsicle sticks in terms of what we can build. And even so you can start to see where it's going, like the potential. It doesn't mean that we're all going to be like living forever and oh, cancer is gone, blah, 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 blah. But you can see that there's a power in that tool and we're starting to <clears throat> maybe not harness it, but utilize it. I would say when the internet was first created, pe people didn't really understand the impact of what was going to happen. The, we, we've had a couple of different paradigms in terms of computing. And I think that the 21st century biology is going to be that driving platform, computational biology, essentially what you're working on and what other connected fields. So AI plugs into it quite a bit as well. But how much of a change can we expect 
I know no one likes to give predictions. Do you, do you do any type of predictions? What would be like a 20 year time horizon if you had to throw your hat in there for something? Only because I feel compelled to say this every time someone asks me 20 year prediction. I'm, I, if we don't change what we're doing, um, all of our computational power and biology knowledge is going to be freaking useless because we're in the midst of a really massive extinction event. And we should probably get our heads out of our asses. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not all like just happy, like, Oh, cool. The sky's the limit. Sometimes we have to acknowledge that, um, a lot of our technology is probably going to be going towards uh, cleanup, fixing the messes that we've made in the past. Um, but I mean, like, like all technologies, the most powerful and fundamental changes are always innocuous. Um, you know, at some point you're going to look back and realize that, like all of your plastics are basically burped out by milk, you know, or or yogurt. Uh, what I, I mean, that, I mean, actually, the the yogurt example is a really good example. So many, so many of our pharmaceuticals are made in bacteria with bacterial synthesis, and so um, you know the fact that you have to pay. A certain amount of money for for a medication that's made out of bacteria uh, means that, or yeast means that, hey, I can totally do that in a cup of milk too. Um, and those are going to be, it's going to become normal though. It's not going to be like the the crazy. It's only in retrospect that it's crazy and world changing. Yeah, and when you look back, it just kind of becomes ubiquitous. It's it's hard to think that it was only thirteen years when the iPhone was created and suddenly people today can't really think about their lives in a very effective way without a smartphone and constant connectivity. Yeah. Just becomes the new normal. Mm -hmm. there, there's two different things that you brought up that I want to unpack. A, the growing it out of my own milk container and making everything just so much more accessible to everyone so that that's one thing that's happening right now is you see a lot of the transformation in healthcare is happening not from the healthcare companies because we have the fda and things cost too much but from guys like you that are willing to try something that seems outlandishly crazy and then figuring out this does this and that does that and here's these new hacks that people can use what is the future of healthcare um <clears throat> the future of healthcare is definitely going to be personal there's no, there's no way for it to progress because um, right now healthcare is fairly stagnant, especially in this country. There's no way for healthcare to progress unless it starts becoming personalized and unless people start um, take, taking control of, of their health and their data regarding that. Do you think that people are ready for that? Or do you think it'll be something where Maybe a company like an Amazon it, or Apple becomes the facilitator. Um, so uh, to, these are two different questions, actually. Um, do I think people are ready for it? Are people ever ready for anything? Like, like no. Like, when I'm, I'm sure when people were discovering gunpowder, they weren't like, well, are people ready for this type of thing? And they're like, no, fireworks, dude. Um, come on. Who cares? Um, so it, yeah, whether people are ready or not really isn't an issue. Um, but, uh, it's, again, it's just one of those things that's going to have to happen. Uh, and then is there going to be a large company that, that does this? Sure. However, that does kind of defeat the whole concept of taking control of your personal data and personal healthcare. If somebody else is taking control of it, it's not really personal, is it? It's theirs. And they own you at that point. Well, yeah. In a lot of ways. I it's mean, uh, it's scary with the amount of data, personal health data, especially. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that that's a... It's 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 amazing that you can still go to the hospital and you can't look at your own records. Do you know what do you know what HIPAA is supposed to be? HIPAA is supposed to be a regulation on healthcare companies forcing them to give you transferable access to your own information. Yeah, that'd be great. 
That that's what no. If you look at, I can't remember the. Oh, exact I mean, I no, I I, yeah. I know I know that that thing exists. I'm just saying there's a difference between something being there in law and something being there in the real world. Oh no, the reason I bring it up is that's the law, but the law is what is leading to such discontinuity and increasing healthcare costs is because of the stupidity involved with not allow, being allowed to have other people. It's it's. Yeah, no, it's, reg it's regulations gone awry. Yeah, no, it's it's all regulations gone awry, um, and we've we're in a very interesting place where we have access to so much information, but having access to information and actually knowing what you're talking about aren't the same thing. But this goes back and forth, and it gets conflated in in a lot of different weird ways, um, like. I've had friends that have ended up going to the hospital and the friends are in medical school and they're like, wow, that was the worst experience ever. These people really don't know what they're talking about. Like I, and then I also have friends, well, not friends. I know of people who <clears throat> are like, yeah, you know, doctors are just in the pockets of pharma industries. And it's like, no, doctors are definitely like, there are things that they know that you just can't Google. And even if you can Google it, um, like the comprehension falls off. You can only like Google so far. You can only Google so far. I've got a friend in Austria who has a master's in biotechnology. No. Yeah. A master's in biotechnology. And he came to visit me, um, at the lab here and, uh, genetic modification is super, super illegal in lots of Europe. And so, um, like you'll go to jail, they'll find the heck out of you um, for switching one code on just a few letters. And so uh, even though he had a master's in biotechnology, he didn't have any bench experience. And so he was like very, very intelligent. But the minute that he had to do hands-on work, it got weird. You know, I was just like, wow, you haven't touched any of these tools before. You need to, you know, so it was it was weird because in some areas he was so brilliant. I was just like, you should do this. I don't even want to. I could do it, but it's going to take me twice as long. You should take care of this step. But then when it came up to hands-on stuff, he was kind of fumbling and lost. And we kind of had to teach him that. So it, and it, that's, this applies to just about anything. You can read the entire book on how to be a plumber for your house, but being a plumber is hard. <laughs> it's really plumbing is hard. Yeah, I would love to give Michael Jordan some some tips on his shot, right? From his uh, analyzing the <laughs> exactly. Form. Right. I have watched so much basketball. I know everything. This if he would have just done what I think he should have done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've built your own lab, and I want to I want to cut back to this. So you brought up the God. You have to go through this entire long track record to build your to get a lab to get students to. So you, you, you shortcutted all that and now, now you run a lab. What do you guys do? <clears throat> um, anything I want. Uh, <laughs> that's the whole point, right? Um, no, so, we, um, so we're a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, which means that we actually do a lot of educational outreach. We work with um, the local science museum. We go to high schools. We kind of do like low level teaching. This is Florida. The school system here sucks. Like we it's all <laughs> retired, right? No, it's it's just it's redneck hell down here, man. Um, but no, it, the schools are really bad. They're super underfunded. We'll go in and do some of the most basic stuff, and and they're really happy for it. I mean, some of these, I've I've been to high schools where I'm just like, hey, we're gonna do this, and they're like, wow, this is the best science class we've ever had. I've never seen the kids so excited. And I'm like, because they're doing something maybe. Um, and, you know, they said, send us an invoice for materials. And I was just like, honestly, you guys are so hard up. I will take the hit on this one. Just, you know, you're welcome. Glad you guys had a good time. Um, and so that's like kind of the front end. And then the back end is that we get to do research. And research is really fun for me. So we're working on a live attenuated, attenuated herpes vaccine. Um, 
We have the CRISPR modification for the CCR5 that we were going to do to T cells. CCR5, by the way, is the same thing that they used with the CRISPR babies. We were actually working on the project before that news came out. I remember seeing the article and being like, oh, that's in my freezer, cool. Um, and then, like I said, uh, biomaterials and bioremediation. So we're working on plastic eating fungus that can live in the ocean, potentially clean up that garbage patch. Um, genetically modifying trees and other plants so they go tw twice as big, twice as fast for some accelerated reforestation. And then a bunch of stuff with biomaterials. So like making plastic-like substances out of insect shell and other stuff like that. And this is why we got him on, guys. We're into the fun sci-fi stuff now. So there, there's a bunch of topics. First, first, let's touch on the CRISPR baby. So we talked about some of the tools you guys are working with now. What's a, What do you have in your lab? What is necessary for people that don't have a background in this to actually... How, what's what's a day in the life of Gabriel? <laughs> let's say we let's say we want to go and edit some babies. Okay. What's what's the what's the so, process so like? We don't that? have we don't have the capability for editing babies. The the edit happens to this the T cells. So the fact that they did it germline or like baby edit for casual conversation is means that it's constantly cranking out this mod um, without any outside work but the mod happens in the t-cell so like a white blood cell um and so what we have um is a biosafety hood for handling mammalian cell cultures and a mammalian cell incubator which is different than your normal incubator it requires a little of carbon dioxide because your cells are inside of you so obviously they're getting less oxygen than the outside of you right um and uh and then and then some other devices for removing blood, extracting the white blood cells, and then we put them in the hood. We take a, a plasmid with the CCR5 gene and a CRISPR-Cas knockout, and we put that plasmid and modify the white blood cells. We grow them up and select for the ones that have been modified, and then in theory, you would inject that back into the person that you took it out of, um, and they would basically hyper-compete and... Uh, obtain dominance is the theory. I think in the end, you probably still have to do a bone marrow thing, but for proof of concept, T cells and just a blood draw is where we would start. Are you scared at all by the by the Pandora's box aspect of genetic editing? Not really, um, and and it and it's for <clears throat> it's for like the most ridiculous of reasons. Um, and it, again, it goes back to this understanding what is and isn't possible. You know, it's like, uh, it's, for instance, CRISPR mods, right? Everyone's like, oh gosh, we're just going to CRISPR everything. I'm going to CRISPR myself. And it's like, cr CRISPR is just a pair of scissors, right? Like to do good work, to do proper work, to do anything that actually works, um, you need to have a full tool set. One pair of scissors is not going to turn you into like a master carpenter, right? No, no but one, one eraser can ruin a book. Uh, I mean, technically a book is printed. Um, an eraser is not going to ruin a book. <laughs> too, too, too exactly, too sad, but... exactly. And this is the mentality. Um, and <clears throat> to be fair, an eraser doesn't ruin a book. A hand holding an eraser doesn't ruins a book. A pair of scissors can ruin a book too. But like CRISPR is just the scissors. It's not even the hand. Like you also need some sort of vector to make it go in between the cells. Otherwise, you'll just modify a cell, which is totally useless. Um, so there's like a whole panoply of of things that need to be done to do even low level modifications. And to top all of this off, the media exposure about these technologies has been so hyped up, it's almost painful at this point. Um, they're like, oh gosh, CRISPR, we're gonna break everything or change everything or become superhumans or now how we're gonna live forever. And it's like, no, no, because we, we, we don't actually understand how biology works. We under, it's not like computers because computers we made. So you get enough people in one room and they can tell you everything about how your phone works from the, the silicon up, right? But if you get 
every person who knows everything about the human brain into one room. They'll be like, yeah, we're rocking out at about 2% comprehension of how this thing functions. So <clears throat> when you're like, oh, I'm going to drive a car because I learned how to make a tire. It's like, no, you're really not. You're definitely not going to repair that car. You're not going to trick that car out and install a nitro system. You, you know how to make a tire. Good, good job. See, I think, I think that is a point, but I think the fact that we don't know, we don't know what we don't know. So there, there will be, regardless of precautions that are, that take place, there will be unintended consequences well, because yeah. we, mean, we always, always a, reach for more. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to disagree with that. I'm just going to say that like, I mean, if you took someone who had never seen an automobile in their entire life, which is basically, if we're following the analogy, you take your average person, you hand them a vial filled with some sort of CRISPR plasmid, and you're like, all right, buddy, hack away. So if you took someone who's never seen a car in their entire life, and you took the keys and put them on the dashboard of the car, and then you opened the door and you said, drive the car. especially if it was a stick shift. I mean, the worst that they could do is stall. It, it, you have to be able to exploit a system to do damage with it. And we're not capable of doing that at this point. We as in humanity or we as in high level researchers? Uh, I, to be fair, even high level researchers, like, the more high level you get into research, like if you talk to actual researchers, not thought leaders or entrepreneurs or Elon, um, uh, but if you actually talk to people who know the science, they're like, no, absolutely not. We can do X, Y, and Z, but we're actually missing the rest of the alphabet. Um, and, and the other thing is because it's biology, it's, it's alive and it's independent of us. And so even if you're modifying, especially if you're modifying bacteria, you'll put a gene in that bacteria and the bacteria and you actually don't want the same thing. The bacteria wants to be the best bacteria it could possibly be. You want the bacteria to be a, you know, yeah, go in the drug, drug production factory. Um, and so um, all of the tools that we have for modifying genes, we stole from bacteria which means that they're way better at it. We're like two-year-olds with, with, with crappy scissors. Bacteria are like master swordsmen. And so you put a gene into a bacteria, maybe it just doesn't go. And you'll be in a research lab, a high-level research lab, and somebody will be like, so what happened? You're like, bacteria didn't feel like doing it today. Or the bacteria does take the gene, it starts making you know, your insulin or whatever, because that's what we use. We use yeast now for making insulin, not bacteria, but yeast. Um, and, but then every once in a while, um, it just decides it doesn't want to have that gene in it anymore, and it cuts it out. And, and then you have to kill everything and start all over. And this happens in the highest labs in the world. The bacteria's desires and yours are diametrically opposed. Um, it's not, they're, not, they're not tools and toys. They're living things. What do you think about the the malaria experiments, the the Gates Foundation, <coughs> what they're trying to do with essentially genetically editing mo mosquitoes to breed them the no. malaria carrying ones out? Um, I think that that's great, actually. Um, and there's been some real success in Brazil. Uh, like when Zika happened, Brazil was just like, and we're done, we're doing this, and they had like a ninety three percent reduction in outbreak. Like, like that. It was amazing. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a couple of pieces of, there's like one or two pieces of technology that are really, really powerful. Um, but they're just not, nobody utilizes them because they're gene drives. Yeah. Gene drives, gene drives are, gene drives are probably the one scary piece of Genetic that's what, that's what most people think about when they think yeah. about it, where they don't realize they don't realize there's a difference. And I think that's why some of the some of so, that's why I think it's easy to 
underhype certain things if mm-hmm. you're talking in specifics versus talking in the generalities that most people think about. Most people right. don't realize there's even a difference. Right. And so that's the thing, like, cause we were talking about general genetic engineering technology. Mm-hmm. The hype is way too high on that. Gene drives are scary. I mean, scary, cool, but scary. There's there's an evil <laughs> mad scientist glint in his eyes right no, now. They're, guys, really, who can't they're, see the video. Really, they're really amazing. It's an amazingly powerful tool. Um, it still has a lot of the, the issues that we have with genetic engineering in general, which is you got to get enough of it to saturate a population. Like you can't just get like one mosquito out there with the gene drive in it because it might get eaten or just die for random reasons or, you know, not find a mate. Um, You have to release like a whole swarm of gene drived mosquitoes and Setting up those systems and in, in things that are larger than insects is very difficult. Um, mammalian editing in general is very uh, kind of a pain in the butt. Why is it harder? Um, well, <clears throat> so like if I have a bacteria, so like E. coli, for instance, um, and I modify the E. coli and I want to see what the results are, E. coli in pro- prime conditions is going to duplicate every 25 minutes or so. Which means that after like six hours, we've gone through 12 generations, 13 generations. And so you can see how that thing progresses. It's like if I want to modify a dog or a cow, it's like one, it's hard, to, like it's internal. All the things you want to modify are internal. First, you got to get the egg out, then you got to modify the egg, then you got to put it back in, um, then it's got to gestate. And sometimes we found that actually, um, for instance, like sperm mediated gene transfer, it's like when you modify, you modify the sperm and then the sperm carries it to the egg as opposed to taking the egg out, um, which seems to be a really cool technology. But then we found that the modified genes, when they got to the egg, the egg would actually rewrite over them. And so, there, you know, there's another big roadblock. There's all sorts of redundant systems because gene modification and like, oh God, it might be cancer on a cellular level, your DNA kind of recognizes the same thing. And there's all sorts of redundant systems for making sure that you come out more functional than less. And so when you're like, I'm just gonna smack this awesome gene in there, your body's like, yeah, not so much, man. Um, So you get all all these different things. And then of course you wanna see how it affects a population over time. So then you gotta like, have a baby cow and then grow a baby cow into a full cow and then breed them again. And it takes forever, you know, doing multiple generations of cows, you know, there are 12 generations of bacteria. If you wanted to do that with a cow, it's like, that's a freaking career right there of just breeding cows. So it's just a big pain and it's not even worth the effort, honestly. That's why everybody works with bacterial stuff. And fast. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't get as much data as well because the cow might have one cow. You're not exactly. You know. I'm not getting, you know, it doesn't exponentially grow like a bacteria does. The, the data is small and lossy and filled with redundant systems that don't like your modifications. So one thing that I think about when I think about gene drives is the fact that genes, at least to understanding have different there's almost like a spectrum of how they affect things. For instance, malaria, uh, sickle cell anemia is what essentially African Americans or people from Africa evolved to fight malaria. That's that's a good thing. But if you go on the opposite end uh, end of the spectrum, it becomes sickle cell, etc. Yeah. Do you think Do you think we're going to find this with most genes? Where like intelligence, if you become more intelligent, you're more likely to be autistic. Uh, no. Um, so this is an apples and oranges comparison. Um, also in like, like sickle cell. So part of this has to do with your wording. There's a, there's a lot of different things that I'm going to need to unpack with this, with this question. Um, so part of it has to do with the wording. Um, uh, you said the statement, we evolved sickle cell to deal with malaria. And, yeah, I, I said that. I said that incorrectly, but well, I think it, you know it, what I meant. It, it, no, but it's important to to mention this because it, it it's actually the opposite. Um, it's just that people with sickle cell 
didn't get malaria. And so they lived more, and which, is, which is really important. Like we always talk about, it's so common for non-biologists to talk about um, evolution as like a, a cause and response. Um, and when really it's the exact opposite. Yeah, it's, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's uh, evolution doesn't mean that you're building towards something great. It just means that you die less, which is, um, you know, you're the only one who hasn't drowned yet. Um, and so um, when you start thinking about that concept and uh, approaching the rest of your question here, um, that's just one gene like the whole sickle cell thing. It's actually a really simple, simple mutation. Um, whereas like intelligence is a very, very complicated uh, thing. Um, and it's affected by environmental factors and social factors and genetics and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and so uh, you could in theory increase some of the things that we associate with intelligence um, and and not get any sort of denotable increase in intelligence. It's um, and you know again this falls under the category of things that we are very very hard pressed to define. Um, you know how do we define intelligence? What do we define consciousness as? And all this other type of stuff. Like where where is intelligence? And it's like it's a it's a complex and emergent system. So it, that's a question that can't be answered because we don't know how that works. <laughs> Do you think we'll ever understand how it, how the body in general works enough to have a Gattaca type society? Um, only if you, I mean, okay, again, uh, two things. One, we totally have a Gattaca type society. Um, Gattaca never had genetic engineering. They were just, they would just screen. They would just screen embryos. We totally do embryo screening all the time. That's a very common thing. Um, uh, and, and, then, and then the other one is, the other part of that movie was the guy who was not supposed to be alive totally went and kicked the ass and was awesome. Yeah, he worked, so, he worked harder. Yeah. Uh, so all of those things, like, like your example is the answer. Um, we have that and we don't really know how it works. And it turns out that even when we think we know how it works, there are options around it. What do you see? Do you see a lot of stuff happening on the black market side of things or what's the cutting edge that people don't talk about? People have talked about the CRISPR babies a bit. I imagine there's other things happening that is less public. Um, you, You'd think so. You would think so, but everyone is so excited about biology right now that, like, I mean, the the only things that I know about that are less public are just because the people working on them are responsible enough not to live stream once a week about whatever random stuff that they're doing. They're just being responsible researchers and trying to get good data before they talk about them. Not, but there is no bio. The, the biggest biology black market is that it's really freaking difficult to get a hold of laboratory supplies unless you're a vetted company. And so sometimes people get online and they're like, hey, I need this molecule. And nobody's making drugs, nobody's making anything that we would consider bad. They just, they just want to do science. Um, and the the access to information and materials is restricted. And so sometimes they have to ask friends for help, you know, but that's like you being 14 and not being allowed to eat candy bars. And so you ask your friend to bring you a candy bar at school. It's not really the black market. It's just finding a loophole around something silly. Do you think those type of regulations are helpful or harmful when there are major upsides, but also potentially major downsides? Um, So I think that the, Part of the problem is that the regulations that we have for things that are really like nobody's ever going to use certain kept, like most of the stuff in my lab is completely useless for anything other than biology work. Nobody's going to, you can't make anything dangerous with most of this stuff. 
and it's still really freaking difficult to get a hold of it um, because it because there's just a blanket rule because it's so difficult to go through every single chemical and be like, okay, well, is this is this potentially a bomb? No, it's not potentially a bomb. Okay, check it off. Um, and so instead, um, they just kind of have a blanket. They're like, okay, if you're selling chemicals, like you just got to vet everybody. So um, this can be a huge restriction because uh, there's a lot of really cool work that could be done, um, but things are very, 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 very expensive um, and very, very difficult to get a hold of. And because they're very, very difficult to get a hold of, um, these companies create little monopolies and then they make it even more expensive. And so some of these things are ridiculously expensive and they don't need to be. It's like, Here's a case of plastic tubes, um, but because they have like our logo on it, it's you know five times what it should be. Or here's a molecule that is super easy to synthesize, but you can't get it anywhere unless you buy it from us, and so it's going to cost you three hundred dollars. Sounds like the FDA. Well, I mean, kind of. Uh, the problem is that that it's not a it's not a one to one type of thing. Again, this comes back to this, this blanket uh, legislation. Uh, back in the day when they made the FDA, it was very, very important. Um, people were, because you could put anything in a bottle and stack a label on it and sell it to people. And people, as a general rule, tend to have moments when they're very desperate. You know, they could be dealing with death. They could be dealing with a child. They could be dealing with an addiction problem. And Facebook has these as targeting options now. Yeah, too. exactly. Right. Um, I mean, this is where most are advertisements. It's all about preying on the desperate. Um, and so, in a in an effort to restrict people's ability to prey on others, um, which really should just. I mean, maybe everyone could stop being an asshole. That would be awesome. Um, but in an effort, sorry if cursing is not allowed. Oh, no, it's, it's um, all good. Okay, in an effort to restrict um, people from being jerks to each other, they're like, okay, look, you got to vet your your bottle of weirdness. You got to send it to us. You got to send us the data that says that you made like forty mice drink your magical tonic, and the mice did not die or lose all their hair. And, and this was actually a really good thing. Uh, and even now, it's a really good thing. Uh, you'll get people who are trying to circumvent the FDA currently, and they'll, left to their own devices, people stick anything in their leg. <laughs> but, um, but on the other hand, the FDA, they're, they're not the bad guys. Uh, if you get enough good data, you can actually um, present present this data to the FDA, and they will greenlight your project. They'll try to hustle it through. And yes, there is a very long process. And initially, that very long process used to be worthwhile and not as long. Uh, but now, of course, you know we're in late stage capitalism, and so everybody's trying to grab as much as they possibly can. And so they're really, they're making it financially restrictive as opposed to data restrictive. And this isn't an FDA problem. This is a every single piece of the world that I interact with problem. You know, if we're going to start picking on the FDA for making things financially restrictive, then, I mean, I've got a long list and they're somewhere in the middle. Okay. I know it's about a billion dollars to bring a drug to market. Yeah. And so that, this is something, how do you think about... For instance, let's say you wanted to have a stem cell treatment. Technically, that that's illegal under FDA, FDA regulations, correct? If you wanted to take something out and then put it back in, that's regarded as a new drug that hasn't been approved by the FDA. FDA. That is true. At least if you're applying it to someone else, you're allowed to do it for research purposes. There's all sorts of things you can do for research purposes. I can do all sorts of weird things to myself. I can... I can even make that information accessible to other people and they can do weird things to themselves too. But isn't, isn't this the, isn't this going to be at least some of, or a large part of the future of personalized healthcare is these type of treatments, which currently are essentially close to one off or much smaller scales. Um, 
there, there's still going to need to be a community. How do we do it? How, how do we regulate something like that? That's a better question because it is a very, very hard problem. Um, well, I mean, <clears throat> I don't, I, I disagree with this. Like if um, there, there needs to be two things, there needs to be community feedback, which we generally call peer review. Um, there needs to be responsible science. Okay, so maybe multiple things. Community feedback, responsibly following the scientific method. So someone's like, I did this, this, and this. You know, you can duplicate it. And that's how you get your community feedback. I do an experiment and then I hand you all my notes. And without any prompting from me, you can duplicate the experiment. Like if that works, then yes, the experiment works. That's really simple. Um, and, then, and then there needs to be a, <clears throat> a mitigation of rewards, which sounds really weird. Um, but like, uh, as long as people can financially or socially benefit from controlling access to things, uh, they're always going to make it really difficult for somebody else. Um, so it's like, like reputation economies, for instance, or making a lot of money. It's like, if I have the chance to make more money, of course I'm going to push things in a direction that makes it so that I can make more money. I, that's the, that's what people do. I'm kind of an outlier in that. I don't do that at all. But, um, you know, um, and, if, and if people get things like tenure, right, where their voice has more weight because they've been around longer, like being, every case should be individually addressed with everybody getting the same amount of sway. And when I say everybody, I don't mean everybody, all the people, because then there has to be this whole other thing where it's like some voices aren't valid all the time. Um, you know, they, if I we, had a- We need um, experts. Well, but we need to broaden our concept of, we need to flatten the concept of expert though. Because the thing is right now it's a curve with the experts at the top and the experts have the say and even if you're expert adjacent, your voice doesn't matter as much. So we need to, to flatten that effect. We need education, not experts. We need educated people participating. And we need people to not, you know, count coup by being experts. And then at the same time, it's kind of dangerous because then you have the Jenny McCartney anti-vaxxer movement. <clears throat> no, see, that's the thing I said, education. So not all voices are valid. I know. Okay, that so we we will we will filter some out then. Yeah, no, there's you gotta you gotta filter out on either side. You know, someone can be like, I have worked in this field for twenty years, and it's like, great, you totally know what you're talking about. And somebody can say, you know, um, I am self-educated and have been working in this field for ten years. All right, your voice also matters. Someone is like, I read a Facebook post. You don't get to comment here. And, and, and this isn't gatekeeping. This is just being reasonable. You know, I, I don't ask a seven-year-old to make me a steak. Like, there, there is a cutoff for somebody being able to competently make food. And some seven-year-olds are actually really amazing. I've seen that television show with, like, the amazing kid chefs and stuff. But they're outliers. Not every seven-year-old is just going to walk into a kitchen and be like, sure, here's a knife, here's a frying pan. You know what to do. Go ahead and set that fire. So I want to talk about another one of the experiments that you were doing. You wanted to make trees grow twice as fast and twice as big. Uh -huh. How? What's the what's the genesis of this? Obviously, I, I imagine it's let's take some pollution out of the air quickly. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, if you haven't noticed, we're going through a little bit of some sort of extreme changing of the climate. I think there's a phrase for it. And, uh, um, and, and we've significantly reduced the, the thing that works with the carbon cycle. We're cranking out a lot of carbon and we're not actually addressing how we're going to get rid of it. 
uh, we kind of just were like, hey, you know, it just goes up in the air, it dissipates. Um, and so uh, there was some there was some research that was developed by the lumber and sugarcane industries um, utilizing a, a two part gene modification system to basically bulk up their trees. So you could you know plant 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 a bunch of sugarcane, then you get these big old sugar cane, they grow faster, they grow bigger, you get more sugar cane, it gives you more sugar, yay, I guess. Um, and so uh, the thing is that these modifications should in theory work for anything with a cell wall, which means that this mod could be applied to just about anything. And so you could reforest and redevelop a robust multi-species ecosystem um, in a very fast time. And that's kind of what we need. You know, we basically need to just take like a, maybe a third of the Midwest and just turn it into a forest. <laughs> um, or, you know, I'm in Jacksonville, half of the city is empty lots. It's like, all right, plant some trees there, grow, some, grow something. They've shown that if you grow grow a forest in a small area, that you uh, that that the air quality does improve, and this is something that we really really need. Wildlife diversity as well. Yeah, exactly. That's why I said multiple species. You know, um, and this means increase in fungus, increase in bacteria, all the lichens, all the little stuff that really, really matters for remediating the soil, for pulling toxins out of the air, for breaking down heavy metals, also creating an environment, you know, we're like 80, we have 80% less insects than we did 20 or 30 years ago. Like, you remember when you were a kid and you'd go on a road trip and the windshield was completely covered in bugs? You know how that doesn't happen at all anymore? Yeah, Dad, you thought about that. I always thought maybe wipers or something, but yeah, I never really yeah. thought about that. Yeah, because because all those are gone, all the bugs are gone. We've killed off eighty percent of the terrestrial species, so land land animals they're all gone. Um, it's just it's not personally affecting you yet, and so you're just like oh, I never really noticed that. It's like, no, all the insects are gone. So building these environments where things can thrive is actually really, really important. Because at some point, there's gonna be so little left that there's not enough to support us. Because like, we're kind of apexy. So we're on the top of a very, very tall tower of, of species. And we've been systematically washing out the bottom. And as long as we're on the top, we don't really matter. Or we don't we don't care. None of this matters. You, you look down. You're like, hey, look how high up I am. This is awesome. Um, but at some point, um, the sand gets washed out, and then it all falls over. And house of cards. Yeah, and we're right in the middle of that right now. So, the the trees thing sounds incredible. It also sounds potentially. How, how do you how do you do it, experiments like this? And when do you start to in the in the life cycle of that, start to introduce new trees or new plants or new animals into the wild to see how it really really takes. Um, so that's one of those things where <clears throat> so I used to go to University of Washington, and University of Washington used to be well known for getting firebombed their greenhouses, because they have these amazing plant research greenhouses. They would get firebombed like every five years. Some environmental protester would throw, uh, you know, Molotovs at it and burn the whole thing down. Really? And, oh, yeah. It's a thing. They don't do it anymore. They've kind of gotten over it. I think they're yelling about something else now. But <clears throat> the last time that it happened, um, it was like um, there was this really amazing study about – because like, like I said, we don't understand biology. So the best way to understand biology for us is to go into the genome and break things and then grow the thing and see how it works. And so imagine you have an aspen tree and you just go in, you're like, okay, this aspen tree, I'm going to break this gene and this aspen tree, I'm going to break this gene. And, and, then, um, and then you grow the aspen trees and you're like, well, this aspen tree is fine. Obviously that gene isn't super important. This aspen tree is growing in a corkscrew. All right. That is the grow the tree straight tree. 
gene. And then there's another one that's like, this aspen tree is floppy. Like it's flopped over and it's lying on the ground. So that's the keep the aspen tree upright gene. You know, don't make it into a sponge. And so this is how we understand all of these things. And this is what this uh, greenhouse was doing at the time. And the concern, because they, you know, of course made a statement and so sort of like, what are these, what if these things get into the wild? And it's like, you know why there are no floppy sponge trees? Because floppy sponge trees don't work. Like it's not a, not a concern. Even if the pollen got out there, they just, they'd breed themselves right out. Um, but this other stuff, it's like, if this is effective, um, it's really important that it gets out there. And there are concerns. People are like, oh, you know, we go around genetically modifying the, the environment. It's like, we have been selectively killing and modifying species, all sorts of species, like since we started walking upright. You know, every, every dog in the world comes from one breeding pair of wolves. Did you know that? Yeah. So it's like, look at a pug, and then look at a wolf and then be like, ah, oh, I don't like genetic engineering. It's like, eh. I mean, you kind of do. You eat mm -hmm. watermelons and corn on the cob and you like a pug. I mean, you, you love genetic engineering. Ruby red grapefruit fruit. Great. To be so, fair, yeah, to be fair, the pugs are ugly, but. And you have to wipe their faces all the time. They've been modified so much that they can't even breathe or breathe. It's crazy. Yeah, it's um, it's crazy how people, no matter what it is, set a limit, an arbitrary limit on something. This is okay, and this is not, and anything further right. across that well, and, line. And it, it has to do with the thing that we were talking about in the very, very beginning, you know, contacts versus LASIK. It all has to do with your exposure and your comfort level. So what I'm hoping to do, to actually answer your question, um, what I'm hoping to do is get some good preliminary research and then basically create totes, like a bin, that you can send to someone that comes preloaded. It's basically a forest in a box. And say you've got like, you know, 30 square yards outside your backyard, uh, outside your house. And just like, all right, I'm gonna rip it all up, turn it into a forest. You follow the easy to follow IKEA instructions, and in a year you have, you know, ten foot tall trees. That would be pretty that would be pretty magical in a lot right? of ways. Mm -hmm. And if you follow the rules and make it as <clears throat> restrictive as possible, uh, the trees won't spread their genes to other trees and stuff like that, in theory. Mm -hmm. Not that it really matters at this point. We're kind of boned, so if if giant trees just show up everywhere, like, are we really going to complain? Mm. It's uh, how do you think about the the differences? So right now you're working primarily, I would argue, on the. So for instance, let's say let's say that a lot of these tools they can be used for good, but they can also be used for the the super bug side of things, not necessarily to try to create something negative, but accidental as the result of research into different types of viruses, uh, bacteria, et cetera. Do you, see, do you see those as being large threats? No, no, this is, uh, this is a great and common question. Um, <clears throat> super bugs are so like engineered super bugs are really not a thing. Like, it's actually difficult to accidentally make something malicious in the bacterial world because, because of two things. One, we're really created, I mean, we accidentally gave a bunch of bacteria antibiotic resistance, um, you know, through very trying to help people. But actually making a, like an evil virus, anybody who has the competency to make like a bi like bioterrorism isn't actually a thing, you know. Nobody has a lab where they're cranking out some sort of genetically engineered. It's like a it's a myth that we tell ourselves to to put more money into that, but nobody's using a lab to do that because once you know enough to be able to theoretically do this thing, you also know that the chance of you also catching it is so freaking high 
you know, like, so we both have brown hair, right? <clears throat> so if I, like, the way that genetics works, if I made a virus that only killed people with red hair, for instance, the possibility that it's also going to kill me is freakishly high because you can't, you can't hyper select like that. Again, remember these things are alive. They do what they want to do, not always what you want them to do. Anyone who knows enough to make these things also knows that that's a thing. And so superbugs, the worst superbugs we have are because of antibiotic resistance. Nobody makes superbugs in a lab. It's, it's like a, it's a myth, it's a story that people tell each other to get funding for projects. I didn't think about it so much as people making it in a lab, although I would argue that if you have suicide bombers, then there are certain people that are willing to sacrifice themselves or something. But what I meant more is when people are trying to do good and accidentally create something. And I mean, yeah, over the course of generations, we managed to create antibiotic resistance, but like <clears throat> things take generations. It's really hard to just accidentally make something where you're like, oh, I'm messing around. And, oh, this one bacteria is actually flesh eating. It doesn't actually work like that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is, it's, it's like a weird question to answer because <clears throat> the answer is that that's not how biology works. What are you, what technologies are you most excited about and why? Um, I'm really, I'm really excited and interested um, about about the the remediation technologies, the the things that take garbage and turn them into something useful, and that doesn't mean turning your plastic bags into gasoline, but things that like suck carbon out of the air, things that um, or things that do that inside of a human being, you know we like to put a lot of garbage in ourselves as well. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, it's so, <coughs> I mean, when you say technology, I've got some genes that I'm really excited about right now. Like, like what specifically? Um, well, for like the, like the, the tree project, the PXY gene and the CLE gene, they're very cool. Um, they have to do with cell proliferation and organization in plants. Um, so that's going to be really cool. P53 in humans, uh, higher instances of P53 show lower instances of cancer. So you basically just smack a bunch of repeating P53 segments into, into a person and, and their, their chance of cancer just falls right off a cliff. Um, there's a bunch of low hanging fruit. We have like a list that we just call the low hanging fruit list and it's like single gene mods. In terms of technology, I'm really excited about AAVs. And the reason that I'm really excited about it is because it's a highly functional, well-established technology. CRISPR is cool, but it's not actually that exciting. Give it another decade and it'll be, it'll start to be interesting. I like things that work so I, I'm, ex I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm an old man. I'm, I'm excited about old timey stuff that functions really, really well. Um, and for biology, you know, it's stuff that's functioned for the last, I don't know, 30,000 years. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the code for everybody. What, uh, what technology scares you the most? Um, uh, the gene drive is, is a little, is a little scary. Um, but I also think that we haven't experimented with it uh, enough to have like a responsible reaction to its pros and cons. We've, we've seen some, there's some theoretical po high potential negatives, but there's not, <clears throat> there's also some theoretical high potential positives, but the gene drive is, I don't know. I don't, scared is just the wrong word. There are, there are certain powerful technologies that I respect. Um, and the gene drive is definitely one of them. Uh, anyone who's doing things with uh, directed prions, that's a, 
or like functional functionalized prions. Like imagine a protein that goes through and it just like ratchets every other protein to be the thing. Like functionalized prions are, are also a powerful tool. Scared doesn't really, isn't part of my spectrum. I get excited and I get respectful, but I don't really get scared about things. Understood. What do you do outside of work? Um, well, this is kind of like, this was my, like you say work. Um, it's work because I get paid. Somebody gives me, people give me money. Um, but I mean, before this lab was here in this warehouse, it was in my living room. And before it was in my living room, it was in a garage. And before it was in a garage, it was in an apartment building. Um, and I used to have a job and then come back to the thing that I loved, which was doing biology work. Now, biology work and my job are the same thing. Um, I like to cook. I cook a lot. Um, and that's kind of my go-to for when I'm not making money here. I can just get a job at a restaurant. I'm really good at cooking. Um, just, just in case. And I have cats. I have some really great cats. So, you know, I cook delicious food. I take care of my family, um, cats included. And then, uh, but, I mean, this is, this is what I do when I'm not working because I don't, I don't have a job anymore. I like that. And I like the fact that there's, there's this metaphor or thought in Silicon Valley, the, the disruptors in the garage, you've got Steve Jobs and Wozniak, you've got all the stories. Now it's starting to happen in the biotech space. Do you think that's going to be proliferating more and more these small little teams transforming the world out of their garage? Or will it be something that starts to become larger scale just because of the, well, so, the scale? So, this is, so like that, and, and that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I remember giving a talk at, at Microsoft um, about this this very thing because um, so the reason that you know garage culture and garage development culture exists is because um, you you hit a you hit a sweet spot where you have an ease of access to materials which we are only just now getting to in biology and only a little bit. Um, and then you also have, um, <clears throat> nobody's jumped on it so hard that they're trying to monetize the hell out of it. And I don't know if that's possible for us anymore. We've hit this point where it's like, you get anybody with a, an interesting sounding pitch and all of a sudden a, a crap ton of VC money from Silicon Valley just rains down and like there is no, and we haven't gotten to the point like this. Passion material, projects. Yeah, you know, it, be, it, be, it gets jobbed. It gets turned into a job. There are, there are no, there are very few passion projects that are getting any sort of support. It's like this laboratory here, like that one piece of hardware behind me that you can see. Um, and for those of you who can't see, it's a vertical laminar flow hood. This thing's like 30K brand new. Um, and so that's not a, hey, I went and worked my job in a kitchen and then I came home and I saved up enough money for a, a laminar flow hood. Um, you know, you got to find like the broken one on eBay. You got to fix it up. And, and the, the minute that you do anything of value, they just swoop in. Like, there's this concept of bohemias, right? You, you know what a bohemia is? Roughly, but can you outline yeah, it a bit okay, more? So like a bo bohemia is kind of like, there were the areas of the city or you know the outskirts of city where kind of the, the poor and enthusiastic about their hobbies people lived. And they would create art and tinker with various things it might be electronics projects it could be some sort of musical device it could be anything and they'd experiment and they were area areas for experimentation um and sometime in the last like 30 years we kind of figured out that that's where a lot of really weird niche innovation comes from you know those garage labs and so and so there's been this high focus on this 
And so now we're starting to pick them a little early. We're not allowing the ideas and the exploration to ripen before it just goes straight into, um, you know, VC capital, Silicon Valley funded, and and locked into all of the other things. There's there's no room for exploration. We don't support organizations like this enough to allow them to explore. And if they do manage to scrape by and make something of value, they get scooped up really fast. And so um, I don't know if it's actually possible for biology to, to do this because anything that, I mean, it's just, it's and it's really expensive. It's not like code. Like you can come up with a great piece of code with a $200 laptop. Like, I cannot function without that monstrosity behind me. And my chemicals cost hundreds of dollars, Every and they're disposable, you know, because it's alive. I have to feed, the, the cells are alive. I have to feed them every day, you know? So it's, it's a completely different system, and I don't know if it's going to actually do that. I want it to, you know? I want this to be the next type of innovation, but I don't know if we're going to be allowed to do that. Yeah, there's an expression in startups, hardware's hard. And I would add to that, that biology is much harder. Yeah, wetware is hardest. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a super interesting future either way. So that it basically means that a lot of the cutting edge work will be happening at laboratories, at universities or corporations. Yeah, and I think the, the best, the best that we're going to see is going to be taking the work that gets done from that cutting edge and then dropped to the wayside because it's not profitable enough for them. And it's going to be picked up by passionate people and they're going to make it worthwhile. <sighs> not because, not because of the bottom line and not because of return on investment, but because they care about it. Like seeing at night with an awesome night vision, right? right? You find the you find the tech and then you try it. Yeah. After lots and lots of research, After guys, of we are we are research. not saying to try this without the the background and what you're doing. This has been a this has been a fun one, Gabriel. If you had to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, some type of statement before you tell them a little bit more about you and where to find you, what would it be and why? Um. Uh, you should always support open access to materials and open access to information. Like restricting access means that you have less people to play with. And if you do that, you're just going to be the lonely kid sitting holding the kickball. Like the more people you have to play with, the more cool things you can do. And uh, typically the better prices you'll get as well. I, uh, I I couldn't agree with that more. That's great feedback. Where is the best place for people to learn more about you and the the crazy, awesome, mad scientist of the future? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, you can uh, go to our website, which is sci-house.space, um, and that is the website of the nonprofit. Um, uh, Beyond that, I don't know, just keep an eye on the, the search results. Usually something pops up. I actually don't go out of my way to post a lot of social media. Um, social media just ends up finding me, and I'm pretty OK with that. You can also email me at gabriel at sidehouse.space. If you have any specific questions, I actually respond to those. And what if people wanted to team up with you guys and to do a research project together? How does that work? Send me an email. I'll, I'll, I'll hop on the phone with you. Absolutely. I'm always open with working with more people. Working with more people always makes things easier. And just to clarify, folks, we're not saying that he can CRISPR your babies or anything along those lines. He is not open for business. I am explicitly not CRISPRing anyone's baby. Mm -hmm. Thanks, for, thanks for coming on today, Gabriel. This yeah. has been a fun one. Thanks for your time, man. Yeah, cheers, guys. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed it. Peace.